My name is Shelby Asesco, and I'm a nutrition support clinician and registered dietitian in Los Angeles, California. I'm so excited for today as we go through eight common nutrition support statements I've heard in practice, and together we'll figure out if these statements are either true or false. So let's get started. Number one, parental nutrition should be ordered based on medical diagnosis or disease state. False. So it's not recommended to use parenteral nutrition based solely on medical diagnosis or disease state. It's important that a complete nutrition assessment is conducted prior to initiating parenteral nutrition therapy and that a diagnosis, so think of intestinal resections or ileus, does not automatically mean a clinician should order PM therapy without a further understanding of the person's clinical status. All in all, do your part to understand the individual's anatomy and absorption capacity, clinical history, and their overall nutritional status, all while considering the patient's autonomy. What do they really want during your decision-making process? Number two, PN should be used only when the gut doesn't work. What do you think? False. Now, our evidence has really taken a shift over the last decade to support the use of supplemental parenteral nutrition in patients who maybe are on enteral nutrition therapy, but we just can't quite get them to meet their nutrition needs or to their goal of their feeding. Supplemental PN is really defined as the addition of parenteral nutrition to enteral nutrition to help meet nutrition goals in their needs. Of course, the hope is to get the, pack, get the patient back solely to enteral nutrition therapy, but we should not be afraid to pull the trigger and really discuss the use and potential benefit for supplemental PN when, in, when it's appropriate in your patient's case. In fact, it's recommended to initiate PM therapy within three to five days in those who are nutritionally at risk and unlikely to achieve nutrition by mouth or through enteral nutrition to support their nutrition needs. For patients who are considered moderately or severely malnourished, it's suggested to initiate PM therapy as soon as feasible to limit any further nutrition-related complications. Let's move on to our next statement. Number three, malnourished patients typically receive parenteral nutrition therapy. True or false? False. Unfortunately, many patients who are malnourished do not receive any form of nutrition support, including parenteral nutrition therapy. In fact, an updated review of national data published in the Nutrition and Clinical Practice Journal in 2022 looked at data using the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project in Medicare Claims Data from 2018 and found that only 2.9% of patients coded with malnutrition receive parenteral nutrition therapy in the hospital setting. Now, we know that nothing good comes with a malnutrition diagnosis. Patients with malnutrition have poor outcomes, including 3.4 times increased risk of in-hospital deaths, 2.0 times higher discharge rates to long-term care rehab facilities, 1.9 times longer hospital stay, and 1.4 times higher need for in-home services. It's recommended that PN should be used in patients who are malnourished or at risk of malnutrition when a contraindication to EN exists, or the patient does not tolerate adequate EN therapy or lacks sufficient bowel function to restore or maintain their nutritional status. All right, so let's move on to number four. PM therapy does not require a central catheter for infusion. What do you think? Now, this one's true. So PM therapy can be infused different ways, including both a central or a peripheral catheter. What is most important to consider is the osmolality of the PM solution being prescribed, as it's not recommended to exceed 900 miniosmoles of the solutes per liter of solution in a peripheral line. 
Any clinician working with parental nutrition therapy should be aware of the route of access available for a patient for the infusion of PN therapy so we can ensure that safe practices are in place. Additionally, the label of the PN bag should also state whether a central or a peripheral venous catheter is needed for the infusion. Be sure to spell out central or peripheral PN to avoid any confusion about the access site instead of just writing something like TPN, which can be misinterpreted, unfortunately, in documentation or in the ordering of the electronic medical record of the patient. Number five, there are different types of lipid injectable emulsions, otherwise known as ILE, for use in a PN prescription. Now this one's true. ILE products are sources of calories and essential fatty acids which provide non-dextrose energy in a PN prescription. There are various FDA-approved ILE products for use in adults, neonates, and our pediatric populations. It's important to understand that the different ILE products are not the same as their dosing recommendations are different to meet the nutrient needs of an individual. Now, some products contain more soybean oil, while others may be a mixed profile, including fat sources like olive oil, fish oil, or medium chain triglycerides. By understanding what ILE product you're using, this will help you know the appropriate dosing standard for your patient in order to supply enough essential fatty acids. Don't forget to monitor your patients on an ongoing basis for potential nutrient deficiencies and also consider the compatibility and stability of the product you select. So let's move on. PN causes central line associated bloodstream infections. True or false? Now this one's false. Now this is probably one of the more common myths out there, but luckily our more recent evidence supports that our modern day medicine practices have really greatly improved the safe administration of parental nutrition therapy. And in turn, we've been able to reduce infection rates over time. However, it's crucial that infection prevention techniques are in place for your patients on parental nutrition therapy. This includes the safe insertion and maintenance of central venous access devices with aseptic compounding procedures, adherence to appropriate line care uh, with policies in place, blood glucose control, and appropriate infection control and sepsis management practices if this applies to your patient. Moving forward to number seven, all parenteral nutrition prescriptions should include a daily full dose of multivitamins unless contraindicated. This one's true. Nutrition societies and experts from around the world consistently recommend that all PN prescriptions must include a daily dose of multivitamins from the start of parenteral nutrition therapy unless otherwise contraindicated. It's important that an age-appropriate multivitamin product is used as different products are developed and tailored for different nutrient needs across the lifespan. Patients on sole parenteral nutrition therapy will become vitamin and mineral deficient if supplementation is not added to the PN bag. Even compounded and standardized commercially available multi-chamber bags do not contain these products at baseline. There are multiple case reports in the literature highlighting the harmful consequences from vitamin deficiencies when multivitamins or trace elements were withheld from parenteral nutrition therapy, whether it be from a clinician knowledge gap or even during periods of drug shortages. The American Society of Enteral and Parenteral Nutrition, or ASPEN, has recommendations on how to handle product shortages if this is something you or your facility has struggled with. And lastly, number eight, a standard multivitamin and trace element product is sufficient for all patients requiring parental nutrition therapy. Now this one's false. Some patients may require additional, or in some cases, less than the standard multivitamin or trace element product in their parental nutrition prescription due to their clinical diagnosis. It's key that you're routinely monitoring and assessing your patients on parenteral nutrition therapy in order to adjust the multivitamin or trace element regimen to better fit the nutri nutrient needs of your patient. For example, 
causes and at-risk populations that may put a patient at risk of nutrient deficiencies include those undergoing continuous renal replacement therapy, gastrointestinal resection surgeries, malabsorption disorders, high gastrointestinal losses, metabolism disorders, for example, liver disease, wounds or burns, and the long-term use of sole parenteral nutrition therapy. Well, that wraps up our fact versus fiction session. I hope you had as much fun as I did talking through these scenarios and statements and learning a little bit more about what the up-to-date evidence supports in PN therapies. Thank you so much for joining us today. Mm -hmm.